Welcome back to We Can Walk About in Our Gardens and Ears Virtually for Vegetable Gardening, Pest Patrol Time. We're coming to you from GardenAtoZ.org. I'm Stephen Nicola. And I'm Jana Makanovich. And that's the outline <laughs> that we're following. We'll tell you as we go along where we are. It's a place where you can take notes or be reminded of what you saw here. You can find it under the webinars and sponsorship tab on our website under audience notes. Um, to start with, we talked about biological control a while ago, um, as in logical and, and using biology against the plant, against the pests and for the plants. Um, so as we walk, work our way through today, we're just going to be working our way through these steps. Monitor the plant, and know, know, it. know it well enough to monitor what looks good and what doesn't. Identify problems, especially anticipating that they're going to happen. And then before you do anything, ask yourself how much damage is actually occurring to the plant and really try to get emotion out of it right <clears throat> and then you, then you manage as necessary and loop back to monitoring again so we're going to try to model that for you as we go along so for instance working with one of my other granddaughters we were just identifying insects and this is willow leaf beetle i, I know it's not a great picture steve but no phone refused it's to, a good picture phone refused to focus on that there's an adult willow leaf beetle on the right. You can see the shiny stuff. And there are three late instar, as in have, have progressed through several stages already of the beetle larvae. And they're doing what beetles do. They are scraping, scraping. Uh, beetles scrape or chew and they don't like veins. So they often, they skeletonize the leaf. They leave just the veins. Now this is on a willow and willows grow very quickly. And although, what a quarter of this leaf might be gone. Only one out of 10 leaves on the whole plant has willow leaf beetle eating it to any great extent and the plant can replace them. It's not doing a lot of serious damage, hmm. but those little larvae are feeding all of your songbirds right now. All of those baby birds are growing up on protein, not on seed, but on protein. And willow grows so fast, it's so hard to, con there's so many insects that get it, it's so hard to control. So we can just look at them and enjoy just them. Well, let the birds have them. And actually I enjoy looking at them. I don't enjoy coming in after I've been crawling around underneath no. our willow, pruning it. And I tell Steve, my, my head is itchy. Look at my head, make sure I don't have a tick on my head. And then I brush my hair and find I have all these willow leaf beetle mm -hmm. larvae falling out of my hair. I mean, that I don't like. So keep your head out from underneath the during their season of growth. Now, one of the things that we do know that if we want to deal with it, maybe it's maybe they are, these willow leaf beetles are eating your tricolor willow on a standard that you cut back hard and it's, mm -hmm. they're destroying all the new foliage that should look the best. So you want to do something about them. Be aware that that adult who now has wings and wing covers is not going to be affected by an oil that would kill a soft bodied younger insect. The oils kill by plugging the spiracles. There are openings in the, in the skeleton, the outside skin of a, an insect, and they breathe through those. If you plug those, you smother them. But that adult beetle has covers over his skin. And so you're not going to kill him with an oil. Um, yeah. Once they get to be adult, they're harder to kill. And you might want to just step back get and, them say, early. and say, next year, I'll remember that those are out at this time of year. They almost look like ladybug larva. Well, ladybugs are beetles, you know. And yeah. No, I meant it, it might, you have to look close. Okay, so um, I know your vegetable garden looks just like this. <laughs> Rosemary beans, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that gorgeous what you can do with lettuce and some kales? And, and this is a this a, is Rosemary Berry's garden in uh, in the Cotswolds in, in England. And this is a cropped garden. It is one that they will take out the lettuce as it matures and let the kale uh, and the artichokes continue to mature in there. Um, so they actually do feed a lot of people out of these gardens. Onions with the lettuce, first one crop and then the other crop and all edged with those beautiful little boxwoods. And, and of they, course, there's always one that has a problem. Right, <laughs> yeah. And there's always, the there's always self-sown little pot marigolds and calendulas coming up in a, in a garden. Anyway, so we're going to do things that we run into quite a bit, um, starting with tomatoes. Most people grow tomatoes. Um, even if you've grown tomatoes forever, you want that, that uh, homegrown tomato just can't be reproduced mm -hmm. any other way. Yeah, Guy Clark's homegrown, homegrown tomatoes. tomatoes. Um, marigolds planted in a row. People say marigolds will protect your tomatoes. There's, there, um, there is some effect from marigolds in a garden, but it has to do with root 
pests. Um, there's a root pest called the root knot nematode. Root knot, as in tying in a knot. Root knot nematode will affect a number of different plants, including some of the nice things like uh, uh, rutabagas and, and uh, the mustard family plant that makes things below ground. And marigolds put into the soil a thing that kills nematodes. So yeah. they can help with that, but they're not going to help with tomato products. They don't keep the rabbits away. We've tomato, seen the rabbits actually eat the marigolds. Yes, they do. They do like marigolds. Which one? And this this tomato is developing problems already. You can see the bottom leaves, um, which will progress to that at the end of the year. Um, and there's nothing more disappointing than getting a few tomatoes and then having to look at that um, by August or September. And it happens to everybody. This is a very good gardener, Sonia's neighbor. He's been gardening all of his life and has uh, had a very long and productive life. And that's what his tomatoes look like later in the year, even though they look like this earlier in the year. Um, most of that is because they need to have more air circulation so that the problems that they are susceptible to don't get out of hand. Um, so don't grow your tomatoes on the ground. The, the diseases that they get some of them are bacterial, some of them are fungal, but all of them, the resting bodies, end up in the soil and splash up on the plants. The further you can grow them up away from the ground, the leaves away from the ground, the less of that kind of mess you're gonna get. So if you look at in a hydroponics situation, here's these tomatoes and you can see one stem right there. They are clear, 18 inches, two feet clear so that before. air can, before you see leaves coming out. You don't need foliage on the ground. You don't need tomatoes developing and laying on the ground. So you're going to uh, stake it up and take out the lower branches and then continue to take out the suckers. You see the little thing growing in the node? On the upper branches, you're gonna pinch out those suckers. You don't need branch upon branch upon branch. What you need are several good branches able to bear weight and that let air move around through them. Uh, and there is a, there's some great information. There's huge amounts of information online. Johnny's Seeds, for instance, if I'm going through their catalog, I can click on growing resources under tomatoes and get a video of two men who grow tomatoes in a big way. See them back there? Big. Showing you how to pinch out the, the tomatoes. I won't try to run a movie because we haven't worked worked for us before to do that. But do use the resources that are there and they're telling you, thin the tomatoes out, take out the bottom foliage, any bad leaf anywhere, See any it? curled, any scorched It leaf. goes, it's gotta go. There is a, an old saying that the best fertilizer is the farmer's footstep, a foot, footprint, sorry, footprint. footprint. And what it means is being there is, the, is what keep, makes vegetable gardens grow well. They are the most intensive garden form that we have. They take more time to take care of than annual gardens and perennial gardens because they require a daily presence. And if the daily presence happens to be raccoons instead of you, then who's going to get and, food? And, and, and it's true. It does require a daily presence. It's yeah. hard to leave a vegetable garden for a couple of days. Yeah. Even. There's stuff going on out there. So what you're looking at here is probably fusarium wilt. It is a fungus that infects the leaf and is killing, is eating, using up the chlorophyll inside the leaf and killing those cells. So you see dead portions happening. Um, it will eventually sporulate and, and splash to leaves above. So what you wanna do is as they're discolored, take them off. They're not doing the plant that much good, get them off. There are lots of them when you, uh, when you put in the name of the plant and the symptom, lower leaves yellow and then put in extension or .edu so that you get extension bulletins. You're gonna find things like this one from, I think this one is Clemson's, where you're looking at yellowed leaves. What kind of yellowed leaves? Notice slight distortion, purpling of veins, <laughs> infected plants. Small holes, chewing injury. You know, it keeps going and going. Yeah, everything you wants gotta, to eat our plants. Uh, so when you talk about monitoring and knowing the plant and evaluating the damage, you have to evaluate knowledge of the damage. Describe the damage because the damage is often described in your terms. Yeah. Yeah. And can help you understand how to avoid it. So if I know that I'm looking for a bacterial canker problem, 
as opposed to fusarium, which is which will make the plant wilt and be a mass by the end of the year. Um, when I click on that bacterial canker or put it into Google search and go looking for it, um, I'm going to find that, that the answer to bacterial canker is probably going to be plant your tomatoes later. Stop planting later. them early and, and, and causing the stems. Don't go to the greenhouse in the 1st of May and ask for their tomatoes. Right, and get the biggest one you can get and put it in the ground right away. Don't do that. Fusarium wilt is going to be more cleanliness thing. So knowing what the problem is helps you direct your, your, um, your response to that problem. And tomatoes are buggy, pesty, they, they have a lot of problems. Um, it's just the way that that goes. We like them and so does everything else. Uh, we saw this at um, Seed Savers Exchange where they grow the plants to make more seed to save when their seed starts getting old. And one of the ways that they prevent disease is they grow their um, tomatoes with a, a straw filter. So there's a bale of straw. They, they carve out a hole in the bale of straw, put in sterile potting mix, and grow the tomatoes in the bale of straw. Now the roots will extend through that potting mix, through the straw, and down into the ground. But the straw, meanwhile, is helping filter any spores that can splash up from the ground to the plants and keep them cleaner. Now this particular image was taken at the hydroponics. Oh, okay. See, sorry. they had the water oh, yeah. underneath in the water here. So oh, they're sorry. showing different ways. But no, we saw it outside at Seed Savers doing the, the same, same thing. thing. Yeah. Um, we've also seen uh, different colored mulches for insect control. Red mulch underneath tomatoes seems to keep aphid problems at, at a minimum. There's a uh, controversy on how it works. Is it confusing the aphid adults and they're laying their eggs on the plastic instead of on the plants? Um, is it reflecting certain frequencies of light? Nobody really knows, but they right. do know that it makes a difference that mm -hmm. the plants are cleaner if I use a red mulch underneath them. Just don't leave it there. Yeah, don't leave it there forever. Take, take plastic mulches up after the season is over. Might be worth a test. Um, so you're looking and saying, well, it's septoria leaf spot. Septoria leaf spot is one that they will tell you uh, and if you have that problem, that you're probably going to want to change how you're watering and maybe do trickle irrigation. Whereas if you have aphid problems, they're going to tell you to water more vigorously more overhead to rinse the plants yeah. off more. Same thing with mite problems. So our circle of life. <laughs> yeah. Tomato hornworm, which I haven't seen for a little while. Uh, this is on the butterfly bush, but this is the this is the adult, one of the adult species of uh, hummingbird hawk moth. And that's what is the caterpillar we call a tomato hornworm, those rubbery, I don't have a picture of it. I don't know why I have huh. a picture of hornworm. I, well, I do have a picture of hornworm from Shelley's garden from years ago, but I guess I just couldn't find it. Um, but they're a big rubbery caterpillar that eats the leaves of a tomato and then will eat into the, into the fruit. The and you'll yeah. take your tomato inside and find that it's got a big green. I, I, I kind of like having them around and, and we humor them a little bit, but like all caterpillars, they're a matter of looking to say, oh, the adults are around. They're probably laying eggs. Now's the time to start looking for caterpillars eating my leaves. Um, and not on your outline, but some people have told me that they are seeing them. This is Colorado potato beetle. Um, it's, a, it's an instar, almost adult, almost got wing covers on it. And it's on Nicotiana, another member of the, of the tomato potato nightshade tribe. And they can do a lot of damage to plants if you see them. So you want to watch for them and realize that they're not, although they look like lady ladybugs, if they are eating the leaves and they are not chowing down the leaves, they're not ladybugs. And you can see that this beetle doesn't mind the veins. It's eating the veins and everything else. And, and they, they also don't mind that it's Nicotiana. Well, Nicotiana oh. is in the family. But don't, isn't nicotine oh. some? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Isn't I guess nicotine it's... supposed to be one of those sprays that you could? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, peas and beans problems. Um, now, we don't have many pictures because we don't get many problems. We get nice clean foliage from peas until they stop blooming. Um, when the nights are warm enough and the days yeah. are, are long enough, they just don't set flowers anymore and you don't get peas. So this is the early sowing of peas, right? Uh, which right now is still making peas, but it's gonna poop out in 
two weeks. But no, we we saw very few uh, yeah. repeat anything, any yeah. problem on the piece last year. Yeah, we just don't oh. see much that happens, but they can get mildew. And I've certainly seen that in some cases, I've just never taken pictures of it. Um, and they can get scorched. Um, these are some of our bean plants this year. And this is not, um, this is not what I would call a pest problem. This is a gardener problem. Uh, gardener problem and a pest problem. Uh, the gardener took the beans that had been growing in a nice moderated indoor temperature underneath lights for weeks and weeks, a long time, and set them out into the sun mm. and the leaves scorched. They sunburned literally. Um, but also the parts of the leaves that were lowest, closest to the ground have been being eaten. And this is earwig damage. Um, you want to verify that it's earwig damage um, you go out at night with a flashlight and then you will never do it again because it's just awful to see them crawling all over your plants. Mm -hmm. But earwigs eat in messy, irregularly shaped holes and edges. See, they're just chewed and crumbled up. They, they don't have a particular pattern. Yeah, they, 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 right. they don't have chomp. a particular pattern. They just, they just chomp. And there are many other insects that eat very distinct shaped holes or eat only from the edge of the plant. This is earwigs. And earwigs have been something of a problem this year in, in some places. They'll get onto a, a butterfly bush and make big holes in the leaves. But what you do get on beans and peas are, are aphids. Uh, these aphids are not, it's not on a bean or a pea plant, but the, the, the uh, cycle is just what you see here. Eggs are laid usually on the underside of the leaf or when the leaf is still curled up. And on a bean or a pea, they'll often be gray. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're called the black bean aphid and they're, they're gray aphids. But you get the eggs in clusters and little teeny tiny green guys running around. What they're doing is sucking on the leaf and taking moisture and nutrients out of the leaf. So depending on how many leaves are being affected and how badly they're affected and how much uh, distortion there is on them, that's cutting down your produce. So if I'm a farmer, I can look and say, well, geez, 10% of the leaves are affected, so I'm, I'm down 10% on my crop. Is that okay? Would it cost me more than 10% of the crop to apply some kind of pesticide? Farmers can use a very, um, a very uh, objective measure like that. They can say, I could get X number of dollars for 10% more crop. It would cost me X number of dollars to apply a pesticide to this crop. Mm, what do you do? Yeah. So the, uh, the, the uh, number is usually set at 20% that if 20% of the leaf surface is being affected or more, then a farmer is gonna do something about it. And that translates to us too, that maybe if you wanna not lose what you're getting, then look for 20%. And that's not 20% of the leaves, it's 20% of the leaf surface being affected. And ants, you'll often find ants telling you that you have aphids. You can see the little green aphids if you look for them at the tip of the plant. And these ants are tending them. They're crawling up and down and, and uh, taking honeydew out. This is a plant that's in the carrot family called uh, Sweet Sicily going to seed. And you'll usually find aphids at the tip growth. That's where they're mm, clustered. Nice, because, fresh. Yeah, that's where the most- Soft foliage. And the most concentrated nutrients. And if you find ladybug larvae like this guy right here, then you wanna say, there, this is under control. Um, there might be, I might see 10% damage, but I'm not going to see it later. You'll also see a thing sometimes when you look at the lady at the, the aphids. If you see aphids that are blown up, not exploded, but puffed up like a balloon and the wrong color, be glad because that means you've got parasitic wasps that have been laying eggs in those aphids and they're working, working for you too out there. I like those 24 seven workers. Sonia's buddy Paul sent her a great, a great video of two ladybug larvies duking it out at the top of a stem with one ladybug larvae going, get out of here, it's my pitch. I got all these, like, I got they all these, they were fighting. Yeah, but or, you can't show you a video, so not so good. They, people do freak out over ladybug larvae. They think they're something evil. Mm. And if you're an insect, they are something evil yeah. because they are, they are eaters. They and are they're, monsters. And they're going to change just like a butterfly um, emerges from a caterpillar's, lar uh, caterpillar's chrysalis, the ladybug emerges from the, it's, it's larvae's chrysalis. Mm -hmm. um, this is reminding me that we, we, on our website, things get lost. There's so much there. 
we have an article called Keywords Unlock Problems. It's in our green thumbs up and down section. And what we did in the keyword section is we put keywords, powdery, mosaic, sooty, decline, dieback, um, bud blast, twig girdler, and linked those to articles and pictures that show you what they look like. Because those keywords, if you put those into a search engine on the internet, they help. They help a lot. Um, it's just and knowledge of the keyword. Sometimes the it, you know put up and put up that keyword <coughs> next for images. You could learn the keyword that way. But um, yep. we have it. Keywords really too. are keys. <coughs> um, mosaic, for instance, is something that peas and beans can get. This is a uh, mosaic on a clematis. Mosaic is a change in the color of the leaf that doesn't. It, the leaf does not lose that portion. So the portion of this clematis leaf that's turned white doesn't die, turn brown and die out. Um, it's literally formed the wrong color and it weakens the whole plant because there's less chlorophyll in those white parts. Um, and that's a virus problem. And viruses are something we can, um, we can see on other plants too. And we know to get rid of viruses like our, our COVID virus, they're tough to deal with. They're mm -hmm. very contagious and mostly we just get rid of the plant. This is mite damage, and this kind of damage is called stippling, where you have little tiny, tiny bits of damage all over it's, on a leaf. It, it, real small. That's called stippling. Whoops. And this is stippling. Let's see, go backwards and forwards. This is stippling on a young bean plant. And that's mite damage. Mites are spider relatives, tiny little things, tinier than aphids, even with a a magnifier, I often don't see them. We're told that you should take a leaf and tap it over a piece of paper and look for dots that move around to know that there are mites. Even that, I often don't see, but you can see the damage, the stippling that's done on them. They are extremely tiny. Um, and the, 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 the problem with mites on beans and peas is that they're on the underside of the leaf and they need to be dealt with with water, just water. If you make the environment moist and cool, mites can't thrive. They like it dry and hot. So growing your beans and peas up so that you can spray on the underside of the leaf rather than having them growing along the ground is a, is a benefit in dealing with mite problems. And mites can be, mites are like Japanese beetles and some other things. They can be on a lot of different plants. They're stippling on the leaf of this eggplant. Further up, there's flea beetle damage. Yeah. When... Very distinct little tiny holes. And there is a bean beetle. I've never seen this bean beetle on any of our beans, but um, Here's a University of Florida's extension bulletin to tell you if you found something, look, look at the larvae of that thing. Is that a bizarre looking larvae or what? Would you run the other way? Yes. So it might look like a ladybug, but it's the bean beetle, which they call the Mexican bean beetle and I think is unfair, <laughs> but eggs, larvae, and then adult. And they can chew a lot of bean leaves. And they also, just, they also scrape the fruit. Mm -hmm. So your beans come out that you have to just chop them into little pieces and you can't eat <clears> the beans. Um, and it is interesting talking about the earwig. So this is earwig damage on, uh, and, and it can get on there another uh, universal taste bug. They eat all kinds of things. This is on um, mountain bluet, Centauria um, cyanus, and it's the gold leaf form. And I haven't seen this happen before. Normally we deadhead it this time of year and let new foliage come up and bloom again, but um, that is earwig damage, ragged holes in all, both inside the leaf and on the edge with no particular pattern happening at night. And if I was to cut this back and say, I would like to have just the new foliage grow up. Well, the new foliage is still going to be getting eaten by and those earwigs. Because they're right there in the ground. And earwigs are an environmental problem. It must be moist and, uh, and protected someplace, probably underneath the ornamental grasses that are behind this. Mm -hmm. So I have to dry out the whole area to get rid of the earwigs or wait for a better year. Which might be next year. Yeah. And what's amazing to me is there's, um, <coughs> hmm, I'm missing a picture. Um, you know, like Japanese beetles, they eat a lot of different things. Japanese beetles also skeletonizing the leaves on beans. Right next to the mountain bluet is calendula hot mirror world. There's one blooming orange off to the far right. Ah. But look at the leaves. Don't those leaves look just the same to you? Kind of goldy green, softly downy, like, and yet not touched. They're, they're not touched. There's something in the collector <clears throat> that earwigs 
obviously do not like. Does that mean that I could make tea out of calendula and spray it on the mountain blue it? This is one thing that people who mess around with stuff like this try. They say, like, if, 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 mm. if there's something in it they don't like, chances are I could use that plant to protect the other, not just by growing it nearby, but by literally making tea of its essence and spraying that on the plant that's there. I might try that a little bit later. You would even think with the calendula, <laughs> the, the leaf actually looks softer and more edible. Yeah. Whereas this, that other one. Chemical factors. Harsh. We're real, we're, I, I'm, I just would really like to see more people uh, share the sentiments that we've shared, which is that we don't want to hurt the other beneficials. Do you recognize this guy on the dill? Maybe if you see his back. Box out no, it's not. No, I it's, thought a, it was. it's a lightning bug. Oh, uh, they're we're, out. Yeah, we're not seeing them flash yet. It's not quite mating time, but they're eating the pollen. Here. I thought it was a box elder bug the whole time I was taking the picture. No, nope, that's a lightning bug or a firefly. Um, and they are, as larvae, they are. They also have a metamorphosis, so they look quite different as larvae. As larvae, they are big eaters of other bugs, not plants. So these are good guys to have around. And, and some of us remember that for a long time, we didn't have any fireflies. Yes. Um, and it was probably linked to a chemical that used to be used in the soil a lot and finally got outlawed in the 70s and took about 20 years to get out of the system enough for these to come back. Um, broccoli and cauliflower, you know, cabbage looper is what we look for, but um, this one has earwig damage on it also. These cabbages um, take off lower leaves. It's one of the reasons to tie leaves up around to protect the, the crown. Um, but cabbage loopers, the first time you eat it, eat a piece of broccoli. I, rem I still vividly remember as a kid picking up a piece of broccoli to eat it and seeing that caterpillar in there. It was dead, but it was a caterpillar. And I remember thinking, I don't like broccoli that much anyway. I'm fine now, but um, uh, you will often find broccoli, kale, all of the mustard plants uh, have a powdery look on them in gardens. And that's because people are are sprinkling powder, sprinkling Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a uh, uh, a bacteria. No, yes, a bacteria that when insects eat it, uh, when they're young insects, it kills the it kills their gut. They can't they can't eat anymore, and they die by starvation. Um, and that's an awful way to go, but it's a it's a less um, expansive way to handle a problem in the garden. You don't deal with the, you don't mess with the beneficials. And that's really um, that and, and aphids, which again, you wash away. Oh, wash away on a cloudy day on, be on beans especially, but also to a certain extent on the kale crops. If you're gonna use a hard stream of water or if you're gonna use soapy water to wash away aphids, do it on a day when it's cloudy, not bright sun, because you can scorch the leaves like I showed you the scorch on the bean that got put out too quickly. Now, squash and cucumber and pumpkins are the things you should be looking at right now because everything's after them. This is squash bug. Um, squash bug sucks and, and drains leaves. It lays its eggs on the, usually on the underside of the leaves of, a, of your, and, and it seems to prefer squash and pumpkins over watermelon and cucumbers, but it can get on watermelon and cucumbers too. So you'll see groups of eggs that are either orange or, or, or uh, reddish orange laid in clusters like this, usually right where the veins join the main vein. And um, you can read all about squash bugs. When you have a lot of them, these are the younger ones that have not yet gotten the wings that I showed you in the other picture. Um, the, they can really cause a lot of damage and your leaves get crinkled up and dried out and you lose vigor on the plant. Um, bug, by the way, is a technical term. Bug is a group of insects that feed by sucking. This is spittle bug we talked about it a couple of weeks ago that makes all these, it, it uh, excretes these bubbles which protect it. But bugs are a technical term. So if it is a bug, if, if you read an extension bullet and it's a bug, then it is a, a, almost certainly an insect that is eating by piercing and sucking a leaf, not by chewing a leaf. Now, one great way to handle squash bug problems is to get rid of the eggs. Is to watch for them. Go and shake hands with your plants, and rub them off. And rub them off. Once they fall on the ground, they become earthworm fodder. They become mice eat them. And, uh, mm -hmm. In uh, birds eat them. Um, eggs. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can get rid of those. Sometimes they're on the top of the leaf, and this was on a watermelon. 
or you can cover the plants during the early part of the year, which is now this last probably started about 10 days ago that the uh, that the the eggs that overwintered on things like the board that's the edging of your vegetable garden, those emerged and lived uh, their very tiny lives to get old enough to lay eggs. That's been happening in about the last 10 days. So at this time of year, if you cover your plants with floating row cover, so air and water can get through, um, sun and water can get through, but insects have a harder time getting to the, the lake. Then you can uncover them later on in the year. Mm -hmm. Um, another problem that, that, and I think a bigger problem with the squash plants is vine borer. So right where the plant comes out of the ground, it'll get attacked by an insect that scrapes the stem and bores into the inside and then starts eating on the inside of the stem. And that'll kill the whole plant. Not, not immediately, but yeah. it starts wilting and dying <clears throat> back. The answer to borer, and see here's where, can you see? close up, see something's been scraping. That's not just white. Uh, that's, they've been working their way in on the vine already. This is a Hubbard squash in our garden. Um, but that vine has now extended itself far enough over there to the left, going in underneath silly plant, going in underneath a fir tree, that you can do what we do with making, growing from cuttings. We can bury some nodes and get additional root systems going so that this plant is rooted in four or five or six different places, not just one place. So if a borer gets into one place, it's not going to kill the whole plant. Mm -hmm. So I move the mulch away. And mulch is important too. Um, a pest we're coming to later. Mulching is very good around squash and, and, uh, and pumpkins. Um, move the mulch away, scrape the soil. So I made a trench there and bury that stem. I buried, I buried like three nodes. You can see one in the top right corner, see a, a leaf stalk, top right corner. There's a leaf stalk sticking up, two, two, three. So I have three new root systems going to start there from those mirror stems. Um, and that will keep the plant in better shape. Um, and then I can say, okay, now I'm gonna deal with the, the next big problem that they get, which is mildew, which most people don't see now because they don't see it as mildew, but it is, it is at work now. Yep. And these big thick leaves are holding a lot of humidity overnight down to the ground and beginning to, to change. Just getting a little pale, a little, little bit of dying. Oops. Yeah. So that um, you'll just as fruit starts to form and you need the energy that the leaves could give that fruit, the vines start dying back. And that's from mildew. So what you do with pumpkins and squashes and watermelons and cucumbers is walk out there every day and every Cut. leaf, every leaf that looks bad, get it out of there. It's a, it. lot, it's a lot of leaves because they're gonna progress from being just a little bit yellow where the fungus is working inside the cells and, and draining them to where it kills a section, to where it kills the whole leaf. And once it's killing the whole leaf and then we get those nights in July that are um, where the relative humidity is really high, it, Boom! It's, it, it just well, spreads it's everywhere. It, yeah, in in huge fast fat, fast fashion. Now there are some this uh, zucchini that has a, a model leaf that's normal, and that's why you have to know what normal leaf looks like. That's it shouldn't be yellow on the edge like this. It shouldn't be dying in places. So you take those off, and while we've got it here, you know that this is a male flower, and this is a female flower, right? Um, I don't know the difference. Well, the female flower right from the get-go has a fruit form under underneath. It. So this is the female and the male doesn't. Right. And what you'll get early on with squash and pumpkins and watermelons, you'll get a lot of male flowers and not very many female flowers. You got to watch for those female flowers and make sure that you either clip off a male flower and brush its pollen right in there. Because if the insects don't do it for you, sometimes you just don't get more you fruit. You don't get fruit. Or the fruit starts to form and then it aborts because it wasn't uh, sufficiently pollinated. And that's what happens when mildew strikes. Suddenly your plants are all gray and then they're laying down. There's another kind, that's powdery mildew. There's another kind of mildew called downy mildew that kills in this kind of pattern. Um, angular, it's killing between the veins. And downy mildew can be, can be worse because it spreads to a lot of different plants, but the same thing's gonna go. Any discolored leaf on a squash family plant, take it off. 
Get, get rid, rid of, of them. Take all that stuff out of there. It shouldn't be there. <clears throat> um, we had a, a, a letter years ago when we were writing for the Detroit News from somebody who said, it's my, my neighbor started growing stuff and it attacked my stuff and now I can't grow anything good. You know, it is true that our diseases and pests can hop borders back and forth, but it's also true that the environment changes and you need to look and say whether or not in the years you've been growing in a place, has the hedge grown thick? Have the trees grown over the good trees. In one case, a house got built kitty corner and two houses down from us across the street. And it was years before I realized that we didn't get the west wind like we used to. Mm -hmm. We used to get a breeze that would blow clear through the house. And that house, three houses away, was blocking the wind. So environmental changes can make a difference. And if you are continually grow and get mildew, then you need to think more about growing things that don't get mildew because you might be in just a mildew prone place. Yeah, it might be. No. Why fight it? Yeah. Now this damage to the whole cucurbit family, the squash, the pumpkins, the vines, uh, the watermelons, and cucumbers, this eating damage that you see, this is a little bit later in the season. This is cucumber beetle. You can see one yellow guy right there. And they like to hide down in the plant. This is a striped cucumber beetle. They lay their eggs um, at squash beetle time, at squash bug time. They're laying their eggs in the soil around the base of the plant. And it's one of the reasons that having a good mulch around a, a, a plant in this family is a good idea. S straw, something light, um, because they can't lay their eggs very easily in that kind of situation. But they can chew a lot of leaves and damage the fruit because they are scraping insects like the other beetles. They're scraping and eating. And then that uh, becomes a dead part on a leaf or it becomes a scab on your, on your zucchini or your squash. There is also a spotted cucumber beetle mm -hmm. with just about the same life cycle and timing. If I, if I wait until I already see the, the damage, then picking them off is a good thing to do. Putting in traps, um, places where they can fall in and drown. We love to drown insects in soapy water or row cover at the time when they're laying their eggs. So anything that's helping with squash bug can help you with the beetles. Um, I don't know why the watermelon got back in here. Oh, it, it happens. It happens in cycles at a community garden where I would stop and help people out and identify problems. They said, is this, are we never going to be able to grow again? We had squash bugs, then we had, then we had cu cucumber beetles. Now we have both of them. Cleanliness at the end of the year is your best friend. Cleaning up the garden. If you're in a community garden, um, like we have a plot in a community garden, and the neighbors just leave their stuff all laying down, even though you don't want to do it, it may be a good idea for you to haul some of that stuff away because the debris that's there is, har is harboring the eggs. And yeah, the that, we think about, well, stores. we just leave our stuff and it, 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 it helps our soil. Well, sometimes leaving it hurts more than helping. Especially on food crops. They have just too many pests that go with them. Um, corn, there's only, well, three problems that but I didn't tell about one of them. Corn earworm and corn borer. Now this is the only picture that I had of corn, so just forgive me for it. When the tassels, so imagine that that leaf is closed back up again. When you see silk tasseling at the top of the corn flower, just mineral oil, just dab mineral oil on the top and you'll prevent the problems where you get the little worms that eat their way down into the corn. That's a uh, 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 corn earworm. And then there's also corn borer, which not, gets into not just corn, but delphiniums and helenium mm. and bores down into the stock. But a little bit of mineral oil, that's all it takes. It's a little bit of mineral oil up there. And when they try to chew down through it, they get killed. Um, this was an interest. The reason that I had this is that this didn't get pollinated sufficiently. You need, uh, corn is wind pollinated. So you need enough corn in position to each other that the, the, the pollen from the silk tassels can blow to the other part. And so this one has only one kernel. See the kernel? One kernel is all it's growing because it didn't get pollinated sufficiently to have more seeds than that. The other thing that corn can do is get smut. 
Um, mm -hmm. And there's a smut is a fungus that infects this. Very cool. <laughs> it's, it's, it, uh, you open up this, what looks like a nice fat ear of corn and inside instead of an ear of corn, it's gray. It's just moldy and, and uh, brainy looking. Yeah, it's actually um, used as a delicacy in, in some cuisines, um, but it looks ugly too. Not mine. And there's nothing to be done about smut except uh, rotate your crops. Don't grow corn for a while because it's a fungus that gets around and gets around and gets around. <laughs> Um, and you're much more likely to be able to grow corn in your garden, mixed in with a lot of different things than growing corn near a farm because they are, they are for sure having corn borer, corn earworm, smut, and uh, they're doing some heavy duty tactics to keep them under control. So if you're near a corn farm, buy their corn um, or grow your corn someplace away because you're gonna get their, their problems. Raspberry gets cane borer and it's one of the really good reasons that you thin your raspberries out every year. So you, you clip back to leave just some vigorous one-year-old stems and even cut them back by half. And you can let new stems come up because at about the time that you're cutting back your raspberries, the raspberry cane borer, which I don't have a picture of, is uh, laying its eggs on the tips of the new growth and the uh, larvae when they hatch out bore down into the, the stem and you don't notice the damage until later in the year when parts of your raspberry are not growing well and are turning yellow and chlorotic because they're, they're losing all their ability to communicate between roots and top as the borer is boring through the bottom part. Another problem that you get with raspberries is virus. Um, we buy new raspberry plants that are virus indexed. It means they've been checked to make sure that they don't have the viruses that they can get but they can get viruses. And once you have them growing for a while in your garden, you're going to end up with some viruses that cause the fruit to crumble. So right there, this fruit is not developing. Rather than becoming a nice um, full fruit, it's crumbling where some of the uh, droops don't develop. And that's one of the symptoms of virus as well as discolored leaves and, and stunted growth. If you see virus in raspberries, you need to change the plantings at a, at a raspberry farm, they would dig up and burn that mm -hmm. area and start over with a different crop. And the other thing that raspberries get are Japanese beetles. And we've talked about Japanese beetles before and can't say enough that the way to do Japanese beetles is to watch in a week, maybe two weeks, the hydrangeas are, the snowball hydrangeas, the round topped white hydrangeas are going to start turning the white. white. Yeah. And when they start turning white, those round topped old fashioned snowball hydrangeas, that's when Japanese beetles hatch out in your area. And that's when you watch your plants like the raspberries that the beetles get on and kill the first bunch that get there. Kill them. Just squash them. You can you squash them. My, we've taught our grandkids to feed them to the fish, grab them and pinch the wings so they can't fly and then throw them and let the fish eat them. Um, knock them off into a, a bucket of, of uh, water that's got a little bit of oil floating on the top of it. It's, do something, if you kill the first bunch, the rest, wherever they go, the rest of that first batch, wherever they go, they will call all the others over there and you won't have this problem of lots of damage on your plants. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. What is going on? I don't know, it's off. Um, okay, so let's go on to questions, I think. Let's see, 938, yes. So questions yeah, sure. here. We've got questions. We've got, uh, uh, actually, I'm going to hold Stacy's gypsy moth question until next section. We'll stick with the veggie uh, question. Instead, Stacy has, uh, she's lost her beans two years in a row. Something's getting at them, even though I installed a four foot fence around the garden. Uh, ideas there? Um, groundhog, if, it's, if you've got a four foot fence, I know rabbits will climb over 18 inches or two feet. Oh yeah, we've, uh, we've seen groundhog them. could go higher. Yeah, seen them do that. I've seen a groundhog in a tree. Um, right, but uh, what else could it be? I, yeah, I, I kind of think that there must be a groundhog involved and I'm yeah. sorry, <laughs> that's so, yep. so disappointing. Yeah, it's always always sad you know, the, when, the, when you do them from seed and you nurse them through and then there they go. And groundhog protection has always been either to fence over the top as well, so you're you're in an enclosed area, or the top part of your fence, don't attach the top foot to the stake. Don't make it Let tight. it rest on the stake, but make it so that if the groundhog climbs, that the top foot flops outward toward them as they get to the top. That can deter them from climbing over stuff. So you, you put your fencing on the outside of your stakes and don't 
don't attach the top part. That's yeah. And while we're on uh, groundhogs, Jocelyn, is there something we can spray on veggie plants to deter a groundhog? Would that uh, would it be like a pepper spray? Would that work? Yes. Yeah, suppo supposedly they don't like pepper sprays. Um, I I have not I have not used it on a groundhog, so I don't know for sure that it does work. Um, I have seen rabbits eating pepper spray stuff, so I can <laughs> develop a taste for it. But any any kind of repellent that makes it taste bad is good. Our best repellent for a groundhog was by accident one year. We had read in uh, uh, organic gardening, we said uh, scarecrows with big eyes were good scarecrows for animals. Big eyes were really good. Hmm. So we we, had a, we found a box full of stuffed animals at a client's house that she kept around for her grandkids. Mm -hmm. I said, can I use some of these stuffed animals? So we just at random grabbed a bunch of animals that had big eyes and set them around in the garden and moved them around now and then. And the one that worked best was this duck. And I said, well, he does have really big eyes. But it wasn't until, I don't know, two weeks after we started doing this that I was walking up to move the duck and I heard quack, quack, quack. I said, what is that? Well, it turned out that this duck had a motion sensor in it and it was quacking when something moved near it. And we hadn't noticed it before as we went flinging all around. Um, so you might want to try one of those little, those little frogs that croaks when you, something that, to, that, that uh, will startle them. Yeah, great, great tip. Um, Helena and Lila are both curious about uh, if you could go over some more aphid control suggestions. In the chat, I suggested that manually squashing them when you can see them using the hose spray. Is there anything else that you could suggest that wouldn't also, of course, take out the ladybug larva and the things that we, we want to keep around? No, that's really the, really the best thing to do is to rinse them off. Um, there are people also who say grow them lean. Don't fertilize heavily when they're in active growth. And this, the aphids are most, for the most part, are spring insects. You, you get some later in the year, but they're in heavy numbers in the spring. And when you get lots of lush new growth, you fuel the first generation of aphids. And so if you don't fertilize early in the year, so some people say grow them leaner and you'll get fewer aphids. Mm -hmm. But no, I'm afraid I don't know any, any other good answer. And, and it's possible too, depending on the size and the health of the plant, that the aphids aren't really going to hurt it much. Um, that yeah, the ends of our cherry tree uh, leaves look a little bit like <coughs> when the aphids are at it, but it's still doing just fine. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, they, they, they are mostly cosmetic, mostly. Yeah. Yep, um, Stacy's asking, uh, when should you tie up cauliflower plants? My friend says every time he has tied up his cauliflower to protect the head, when he harvests, they're filled with bugs. What's he doing wrong? Um, well, when you tie them, depending on what kind of bugs it is, it's probably aphids in there. Um, and it would be a, a good idea before you tied them up to apply a BT for the loopers because the, the eggs are there and you don't know that they're there and you just close them and gave them a shelf and feeding space. Um, and then to, even after you close them up would be to keep spraying them off with water regularly because the aphid um, adults are gonna land on the outside of those tied up leaves and lay eggs that are then gonna end up on the inside. So um, it's tie them up with BT inside and then rinse your plants regularly. Just walk by and rinse them. Through the, a nice shower attachment. Yep. Great. Uh, RK is curious if you have any ideas on controlling asparagus beetles. Other than cutting the asparagus down, which is what we did once. Asparagus beetles um, are, uh, they do eat the asparagus um, leaves this time of year. And they can, as larvae, disturb the roots of the asparagus. They don't do a lot of damage, but they look ugly and people don't like to have asparagus um, looking, ugly. looking ugly like that. So you can cut the asparagus down and deny them food because that's all they eat is asparagus. So if you got asparagus beetles and they really are a problem, you say, you know, this is a problem, cut the asparagus down. Just do it a, a hundred percent um, harvest at this time of year and get it all out of there. And then you can, then you can cut the numbers of the beetles down. Uh, Joyce is asking about orange rust on her black raspberries. Uh, raspberries can get rust, and it, is, yeah. and it is literally a fungus disease named for what it looks like, rust. rust. Mm -hmm. It's got another host. <coughs> I remember what, I think Which it was on grass. Raspberry, raspberry think, and grass? Yeah, I think, I think the alternate host for, for um, <laughs> raspberry, rust diseases, rust fungus diseases are actually two different characters. They have different names. and and they're different states. So in, in one season, they live on one plant and do one thing, and then they move to the other plant and do something different. 
Um, and rust and raspberries, I think, lives on grass in its other. And so you might have rust on your grass and it's hopping back and forth. And what you need to do is try to deal with the problem on your grass as well as on your raspberries. Yeah, but the, at least try to figure out if it's alternate holes. Yeah, so yeah. I'll uh, inter I, I, interrupt this. Cycle. Yeah, I can look that one up while Steve does questions. Okay. okay. Um, but yeah, interrupt the cycle and treat it like any fungus. Remove any discolored leaf. Um, keep your uh, your water on the ground rather than on the leaves because it's a fungus and fungus develop better where it's moist and where there's spores to fuel the, the the fire. Yep. Great. Uh, Karen says my blueberry bushes look like some small black caterpillar or something ate the fruit that was forming. In my house, it's some not very small black Labrador that eats the fruit as it's <laughs> forming. Um, but any ideas about that? No, I'm afraid I don't know which, uh, I, I don't know enough of the blueberry pests to say offhand what it is. But if you know yeah. that it happened, now you know that next year you're going to protect look that blueberry it. earlier. And if it's, if it's something small and chewing, then it is something that was laid on the plant. And so probably row cover to protect the plant early in the year. And, and just mark your calendar, mark your calendar that before the hydrangea blooms and let's see what's going on out there right now, what's blooming. Catalpa trees are blooming if you had a catalpa. Just, um, yep, I'm almost finished. Roses, the hybrid tea roses are just beginning to start blooming. Mark that on your calendar and say, at that point, I needed to have row cover on these plants ahead of time. Yep. And if, if you have seen that they are caterpillars, um, then if you keep your eye on it, uh, soap spray, uh, like a, an oil soap spray would uh, would work there. Um, all right. Uh, one more question from Therese, uh, thinking about uh, buying ladybugs and adding to the garden. And you were saying, I think, uh, Steve, you were saying uh, the other week about thinking about numbers and, and balance. Is there any way to know how many ladybugs you should order in for a garden so that you're not um, overloading the system? I don't, I don't think I've ever seen. No. I don't think I've ever seen any, any guidance they, in that. Uh, or um, whatever. Other, they other, sell them in. Right. Other than to know that in a, uh, in a greenhouse, in a closed environment, they'll release two and 300 ladybugs and send them out into it and know that they're going to stay in that, in, in that area. We never know where they're going to stay. And, you know, you, if you get three ladybugs per plant, that's enough in most cases. So, yeah. So, no, I don't right. And there's no guarantee they're going to stay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, th I guess that's Even the that's the issue. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. That will uh, that will do for now. And you're uh, you're right with Sandy and the pollinating on the pairs. You get fruit drop time, and if there's a lot of fruit dropping, you need more pollinators. Yeah. Okay. So we're we finished with our vegetable class, so we're not going to do any of these other ones. We're going to go on oh. out of vegetable gardening because we want to get through to some other questions. So, so that's our vegetable pest patrol for today. Get out there and look for mildew and, and uh, look for the eggs of those guys before they start destroying your plants. Um, and next, we're going to look at our stumpers department. Uh, again, in our, in our um, newsletters where we write things down, we put things in different departments and we're going to work on landscape materials next. So hang on with us if you'd like to stay. If you were here just for vegetable pest patrol, get out there and start patrolling. Yep and enjoy it.